Well, the state of Michigan is on high alert. Paul Bunyan is going to be on the line this Saturday as we welcome in our Babe the Blue Ox, Anthony Bellino. You see him every morning right here on BCS on the X's and Bros show. And Anthony, before we get to Michigan, Michigan State, we've danced around for the last couple of weeks. Well, let, let's, let's wrap up the Northwestern game at for, for first up, though. The Wildcats and the Wolverines, slow start in that first half for Michigan, but then they finally got it going in the second half, put the Wildcats away, which was exactly what you'd want to get tuned up for the big one this week. And, you know, Mark, fans are still not happy. I, look, I'm not going to lie, that first quarter, you know, coming off the bye week, they, they had some bye week blues. And I'm glad that it was Northwestern and not a more formidable opponent there that would have been able to take advantage of such a sluggish start offensively for the Wolverines. They get out of that first quarter and everything's looking good, but it's more of the same – for Michigan, they dominate on the ground, 119 from Blake Corum, 110 from Hassan Haskins. They ran it 42 times uh, combined between the two of them, accumulated four touchdowns. People still have their concerns about the pass game. You know, 20 completions for 129 yards for Cade McNamara doesn't bode real well in the uh, average yards per catch. They got Eric all a little bit more involved, which I'd like to see. But all in all, if you take away the big chunk play, uh, there was, what, a 75-yard touchdown run from, from Evan Hall. If you take that away, Northwestern's not on the board. I feel pretty good about where Michigan is at after that football game. Obviously, would like to see uh, their aerial assault become just that, an aerial assault. But, hey, if you can run it at them, just keep running it at them. And, and who knows? Maybe they've just been stockpiling these, these runs so that they, they don't build up much confidence across the board from different opponents. If you don't have to pass it, why would you show anything in your passing game? They're working on it every day in practice. I can almost guarantee you that. Is this the week where Michigan comes out five wide, let it fly? Who knows? We don't. One of the great things about rivalries is you can boil down games to just a few phrases. Last year, Michigan State beat Michigan, the Rocky Lombardi game for the Spartans. Yeah, I, I didn't know if you were going to add more insult to injury there or not. I wasn't really sure if we were going to continue down that path. Look, last year, you know, really good win for Mel Tucker, first off. Like, let's let's get one thing straight. I'm not here to bash Michigan State. I can do that every morning for three hours. Uh, but I, I want to be, be sure that people understand that Mel Tucker's done a very good job, you know, with the short term that he had to get on campus after D'Antonio left to be able to get to Michigan State uh, after one year at Colorado to basically work with no spring ball, no summer camp, and then trying to figure out if they were even going to play and having, what, three and a half, four weeks of practice before the first game last year, really an anomaly. And he had his guys geared up and ready to go for a rivalry game. They were heavy underdogs, what, 21-point underdogs. They came out winning by three. Like, you can't ask for much more. Now Mel Tucker had a full off season. They had their normal spring ball. They had their summer camp. They are ready to go. Michigan State is a very good football team. I would say, based on what we've seen thus far, looking at it statistically, but then also with the eye test, they're a much more balanced team. However, Kenneth Walker has ran into some problems. He's had some games where he's run all over the run all over the map. You haven't been able to stop him. He would have ran from East Lansing all the way down to Miami and back, and no one could have tackled him. He's had other games where he's been held under 100 yards. So this is a very interesting matchup to see. Who can run the football more effectively? This thing screams on Saturday at noon, Big Ten football. Like, not even three yards, maybe like two and a half yards in a cloud of dust between Michigan and Michigan State because I really think this is going to be in-the-trenches sort of battle royale between these two teams. Who can run it better? That's probably going to be a winner. Mel Tucker brings an interesting dynamic to this rivalry because, let's face it, there was no love loss between Mark D'Antonio and Jim Harbaugh. But when asked about Mel Tucker today, Jim Harbaugh from the It's a Small World department said, yeah, in Georgia, he lived next door to my brother-in-law, Tom Crean. Tom said he was a great guy, a great neighbor. And so it seems like Harbaugh and Mel have got maybe a little bit better of a relationship than Harbaugh had with D'Antonio. Good. Let's butter them up. Let's make sure that everybody thinks that we're all here to have fun and it's fun and smiles. We're going to eat orange slices at halftime before you assault them, ambush them, right? What did Sun Tzu say in the book, The Art of War? Attack when, when they're not ready. You know, you got to be able to re retreat when they attack and attack when they retreat. That, that's what this is all about. This is the art of war. I like it. Butter them up. Hey, Mel Tucker, he's a great guy. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of that. But he's doing a great job at Michigan State. I mean, let's be honest. There's a reason that other schools are being rumored to, to pick up the phone and want to call to see what the interest level 
Bowl is. And Mel Tucker kind of hushed those rumors a little bit, saying that he's only focused on Michigan State. He's only focused on this week. So he's saying all the right things uh, right away in regards to the LSU rumors. But there's a good reason. There's a lot of swagger right now around that Michigan State program. They have that belief, and belief is a very dangerous thing when you start thinking about when guys believe in their purpose, they believe in their process, they trust that process. Shout out to Matt Campbell, big win uh, this you know this week against Oklahoma State. So I want to give him some credit for trusting the process, not the Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, but I really like that Jim Harbaugh kind of went the really boring route. Hey, I got really nothing, not a whole lot to say in his press conference. Mel Tucker's a great guy. We're na- we're you know neighbors basically because of family. I'm totally fine with that. The last time Michigan went to East Lansing, if we're going to sum up the 2018 game, it would be Devin Bush. Yeah, you know what? Let's talk about 2018. Now, there's a conversation I want to have right there because you get into that whole 100-yard walk thing where they hold hands, the Spartans do, and they they usually have their certain ties on, their suits, and they walk across good field for the, I don't know, the field or whatever they're doing. Totally fine. Then they come out in their track pants, right? They got the track suits on, the warm-ups. They put their helmets on, and then they completely, they show up early. They completely went out of routine. And then they marched across the field 100 yards. Devin Bush is scraping up the turf. It's a historical moment. I tweeted out that's one of the best pictures of all time. Spartan fans are all in my Twitter mentions. It's still one of the great pictures of all time because Michigan State walked further across that field in that game than they did when the clock actually started. Michigan's defense holding them to 94 yards. I think that this game right here for Kenneth Walker, this is a big one. If there was a Heisman push, he's had some letdown games. Michigan's defense, they've got studs at all three levels, uh, defensive line, linebacker, and in the secondary. This is a big-time game right here for Peyton Thorne and that offense. And let's, let's face it. I mean, we go back to 2018, it was all Michigan, right? We go back to last year, it was a complete catastrophe. Trying to sum all that up into this game, I don't really think we have any idea what's going to happen. I think that that leads to a lot of intrigue. I think that Michigan's new coaching staff, the way that they've approached some things, their style of play right now, although their defense has been formidable, they haven't faced anybody with the offensive firepower that Michigan State has. Michigan State, I don't think, has faced a defense as good as Michigan's. Vice versa, has Michigan played anybody that features guys like Panashuk on the other side of the line for Michigan State? And that's why I think that this matchup, this is going to be crazy. You've got college game day there. You've got Fox's big Fox football Saturday, whatever they call that show there. I can't be there, but you might be there. You know what I'm saying? Like all eyes are on the state of Michigan in the college football world. And I think that that's great because we already know that that college basketball runs through the state of Michigan. So this is wonderful. High tides raise all ships. It's better off when Michigan state is good. It leads for better competition against Penn state against Ohio state. I I like it. It's good across the board. First time in over 55 years that the both of those teams have been ranked in the top 10 when they meet. They're both 7-0, and but as you've kind of touched on, I don't know if we are really sure if either of those teams really are 7-0 and teams. Clearly that's what their record is, but neither one has been tested like they're going to be tested on Saturday. This is going to be a great discovery game to find out which one of these teams are, are for real. Who is good in college football right now? I think if you pulled most people, they'd probably defer to Alabama even though they lost, and they'd say Georgia. And outside of that, I mean, look at Ohio State. They've been an absolute wrecking machine since they lost. That loss to Oregon might be the best thing that ever happened to them, right? Get punched in the face and then watch how you respond throughout the rest of the season. It's really difficult to try to gauge who is good this year in college football. And I think that that's actually, I mean, Cincinnati's ranked number two. Are they the second best team in the country? Should they be ranked that? I don't know, but they're undefeated and they have a win against Notre Dame. So it's got to count for something, right? They have to be ahead of Alabama who's lost the game. I mean, I know that the schedules aren't the same, but I just really like what this, this does for college football. And I really like the fact that it's a top 10 matchup. And some people might think that I'm bluffing, but I really do believe that the better everybody else is in the conference, the better the conference looks as a whole. So if this is a tight football game, which I would expect, I, I that's what I expect. If this thing it, it goes either way and is a blowout, and gets out of hand, that would be more shocking. You know, if it's a 17-12 kind of game, or like a 21-14, like, okay, I can I can get down with that. If this thing is, you know, 40 to 17, I think that that's going to be a lot more shocking uh, to the college football world as a whole. You know, we talked earlier in the season how the Big Ten East might cannibalize itself, and maybe we saw a little bit of a chunk out of that from the Big Ten West with Illinois knocking off Penn State as the Nittany Lions tumble from uh, what, the 7th all the way to 20th in the AP poll. Now, that game went to nine overtimes. The new rule this year is after the second overtime, it's just two-point conversions. And Jim Harbaugh admitted that Michigan has been practicing more two-point conversions this season in case they go to a multiple overtime game and have to go deep into the playbook and try and do something maybe a little more tricky with that two-point conversion to win an overtime game in the, that fashion. 
I could do seven hours of programming on, on why college overtime is the worst overtime that's ever been created. I mean, since when do you play football starting at the 25 yard line? Like it's always been a mockery of the sport. It's basically like going right to a shootout at the end of regulation in a hockey game. It's not really hockey. Like that's a skills competition. Why don't we shoot free throws in basketball or just have home run derby in baseball? The whole thing is preposterous, but I do like the fact that coaches and teams are starting to prepare for in the event of an emergency break the glass. Like I hope you get real creative on your two point attempts and hopefully your defense can hold because that's what it comes down to. But with such a short field, what happened at Penn state, they have not been the same uh, since their offense got exposed when their varsity quarterback goes down, they had to go to the JV and then you're bringing them back. It's just Penn state's offense is nowhere near as good as their defense is. Illinois, I think really, you know, surprised some people and shocked some people. I don't think Penn state's as good as people thought. I think that everybody is still chasing Ohio state. I mean, that is the Taj Mahal of the big 10. And it's, I, I'm just being honest here. Like I think that that's why Michigan fans, you know, they, they have so many complaints when it comes to a 33 to seven win over Northwestern and they might beat Michigan state and they could probably beat them 50 to 20. And people would still be mad because it's like, well, why didn't we do this? How'd they score 20? Because they look at those neighbors across the street, right? A little bit down South. They see what Ohio state did to Indiana. It's like, well, why can't we have that? Everyone's still chasing the Buckeyes, uh, no matter what Penn state wants to do or Indiana, Iowa will get cute for a couple of weeks and they'll be in the top 10 and everyone's like, Oh, look at them. Right. And I feel like it's kind of the same thing with Michigan and Michigan state, like these two teams, somebody's got to lose on Saturday. We'll figure it out. God, I hope it doesn't go to overtime. That's not good for my blood pressure. But at the end of the day, no matter what happens, all eyes are still on Columbus in the Big Ten. And another one of those topics that gets the Michigan fan base riled up is quarterback play. As Cade McNamara, you know he's not going to turn the ball over. J.J. Uh, McCarthy is a little bit more dynamic, and there were some calls to bring J.J. into the game against Northwestern. Do you think we're going to see both quarterbacks against Michigan State, or do you think Cade's the guy and Harbaugh's going to keep the steady hand and go with Cade the entire way? Uh, I don't think Cade will play the entire game because I think they – I think what's really interesting about the J.J. McCarthy dynamic is he is a more dynamic player, right? He does offer more from taking, for having the football in his hands, whether he is scrambling, whether he's throwing the football, he's a five-star for a reason. But I think that every time Michigan has put him in this season, one, they've tried to put him in a position to be successful, and they've been doing a, a pretty good job of that. Two, they've given him meaningful snaps. And three, it gives teams something else to have to worry about. And I think that that's really kind of the ace in the hole. Kate McNamara is doing a fine job. Sure, I wish he would have hit. Uh, I forget who was in the slot. A.J. Henning, he ends up taking a sack, I believe, on the play. I think against Northwestern and it's one of those, you got a hot route. You have to know immediately. Right. And, but if you're not throwing the ball that often in the game, that's where it kind of catches up to you. I don't want to bench Cade McNamara. I wouldn't want to start JJ McCarthy, but I do like the way that they have involved him more because Jim Harbaugh even said, you know, back in the past, when we've had quarterbacks go down. We haven't had that next man up have real meaningful snaps. And, and that's important. And I think that they threw the red shirt out the window. He's already appeared in just about every game this season. So I'm not really too worried about that. They want to give defenses something else to prepare for, but they also want to give that young man, give him some pressure because if Cade McNair, for whatever reason, uh, is incapable of finishing a game, they need somebody who's got big time experience and he's taken some big time snaps and some meaningful moments for this team. So I think it's a good thing. We'll wrap it up with this. Last two times Michigan has beaten Michigan State, Donovan Peoples-Jones has struck the Paul Bunyan pose after a touchdown. Who for Michigan this year is most likely to follow in DPJ's footsteps? Oh, Blake Corum. Come on, here he scores in Nebraska and he's eating the corn. I love that kid. I mean, a lot of energy, a lot of fun, a lot of excitement. We got to let the kids have fun. If you saw that Iowa State game, the Tawny penalty, like, get out of here with that. Let the kids play a little bit. This is a rivalry game. You know emotions are going to be high, and I think one really underrated portion of this football game, who stays disciplined. And no, I'm not talking about gap discipline. That's a given. I'm talking about extracurriculars. Who gets popped for the personal foul for retaliating, right? Because they always catch a second guy. Who can handle their composure? Who doesn't get pinged for a flag for an unsportsmanlike for taunting or a celebration? I really think composure and discipline are two really highly underrated, under-touted, not talked about topics of conversation for Saturday. It needs to be had. The more disciplined team is going to win this football game. You can't get caught. I know everybody wants to have fun and I'm for it too. But if the refs are going to be sticklers, just be careful if you're going to strike the pose or eat the corn or do whatever these kids want to do these days. Michigan did a fantastic job of stealing the energy at Wisconsin. They stole the energy at Nebraska. We'll find out on Saturday if they can steal the energy in East Lansing. I want to thank our guests to break down this Michigan-Michigan State matchup. Anthony Bellino from the X's and Bros Show. Thank you, Anthony. Spartan fans, get your floaties because we're going to the deep end of the pool. Thanks, Mark.